welcome, welcome everyone to Give God 90, Radio On Demand. My name is Jerry Mitchell, your host for Give God 90, Give God 90 I'm sorry. Thank you so very much for joining me for just a little while today. Uh, it, let me remind you first off, if uh, you so choose, you can download the Give God 90 app absolutely free. It's available for your Apple or your Android device. Somebody else has paid for it, so you don't have to. Uh, That means that somebody has either purchased uh, one or both of my books or that they have gone to the Give God 90 uh, website, givegod90.com, and they have hit that donate button. Um, But of course, as I'd like to say, the best way to to support what we do is just to live the way your creator designed you to live. Because if you do that, there's not enough spaces on a calculator uh, to figure out how many blessings I'm going to get back in return. All right. It's that simple. Uh, just just do the things that God would have you do, and and you'll be good. You'll be golden, and so will I. Uh, today I want to look at what's wrong with that yellow cow. And of course I'm talking about the golden calf, uh, what I have often referred to as the golden calf incident. Uh, and we find that in Exodus chapter 32. But if you've listened to me long enough, you know I like analogies. I like to compare things that are similar, right? I I can take this incident and we're going to compare it uh, and, and kind of apply it into our personal life today. And I think when we do this, you're going to have a better understanding of exactly uh, what, or I should say why, our Creator was so mad He was ready to destroy everybody He had just brought out of Egypt. Let's begin by pretending just a little bit, okay? We're going to pretend that we are a better than average well-off family, okay? And I am a child of this better than well-off family, uh, and we look around the neighborhood, and it's someone we've known for a long, long time has kind of uh, gained our interest, okay? Maybe maybe it's somebody we used to help in school. Maybe it's somebody that we've known forever, you know, all our lives. Maybe it's somebody that uh, might be just a little younger than us, but we've always known them. We have gone to school, we've gone through school, maybe went to different colleges, maybe went to different schools. I, it's hard to tell, okay? But now, somehow, we've reconnected, all right, and, and through this reconnection, we find out we're compatible and we're going to get married. So we get married. We have this celebration. We go on the honeymoon. We come back from the honeymoon. And as most couples would think, they come back from the honeymoon. And today, you know, they're both going to probably go off and go to work. Or one or the other is going to go off and go to work. One way or the other. Maybe, just maybe. Let's think about it this way. Since you were well off, or since we were well off in this scenario, um, now all of a sudden we go to work, the spouse stays home. It doesn't matter which one, because this is going to work either way, and you'll see what I mean in a second. We come home from work that first day, and guess what's sitting on the dining room table? Okay, It's not just a picture of our spouses, uh, someone from their past, let's say. Not just their picture, but they have now created a statue. And they put it on the dining room table. They're displaying it prominently right there where you know, you're going to sit down and eat your supper. And they're going to say, not only is this going to sit here, but I'm going to use this statue of uh, maybe uh, an old friend a very good old friend, more on this as we, as we develop this, and we're going to say, but I'm going to celebrate you with this statue that doesn't look like you, it looks like somebody else, and, and we're just going to have this big party, we're going to celebrate you. Okay? Now, think about this. The statue of this other person is nude. What would you feel what would be going through your mind? You, you have developed this relationship with this person. You have told them you're going to take care of them. You have committed to them that you know, you're, through this marriage covenant 
that you're going to care for them till death do you part. You have said to them, I love you. I want you to be part of my life. I will care for you. I will, I will bind your wounds when you're injured. I will heal you when you're sick. I will do all of these things for you. And now, you think you can remember, you think you can celebrate me with a nude statue of somebody you used to know. What does that do? How many things that you could consider are now violated? You have put someone else in my face. You are, you are literally bringing someone else into this relationship, right? Not only have you done that, you have gone so far as to not just bring them into that relationship, you're showing them off to me. You've created this statue to them that that you have sat in this prominent place where I have to sit and watch it when I'm eating supper. Maybe when we have children, they're going to have to sit here and, and see it when they do their homework. Maybe when friends come over, they're going to see this thing and wonder what in the world is going on, right? Not only that, you have now stolen, you have stolen my generosity you have are trying to steal my love and pawn it off on something else you're trying to uh to basically commit adultery right because now all of a sudden things are are going differently than you had planned you know in any relationship there's going to be a time of of, uh making sure that uh, you're, you're compatible, making sure that you do things. And typically that's done before the wedding. But sometimes in an arranged marriage situation, you don't have that opportunity. So you have to work things out in such a way. But in our scenario, when we come home and we see this nude idol of a past uh, involvement shoved in our face and we have all of these feelings going through us, our first instinct is going to be not to say, oh, dear spouse of mine, what have you done? Our first instinct is going to be what? It's going to be to probably pick that thing up and, and beat our new bride to death with it, right? Now, now I'm tongue in cheek just a little bit here, but not by much. Because it would throw anyone into a, a fury. I I really believe it would throw anyone in into a fury because we have proof of this in Exodus. When <laughs> when the Almighty sees what they have done, he knew they were doing it. Yes, he knew they were doing it. But when it's completed, when they went through with it, what happened? He told Moses, just stand back. I'm getting ready to wipe them out. I'm going to kill every one of them down there. Because what had they done? God had brought them out of Egypt. He'd brought them out of their bondage. He had done everything he could to improve their life. He had basically brought them to a place and said, Here is our marriage covenant. If you will live this way, I will take care of you. I will make sure that nothing bad happens to you. All they had to do was live the way he intended for them to live. And what did they do? You know, Moses goes up to get some further instruction. And all of a sudden now, we see them come to Aaron and say, Aaron, you know, Moses... What happened to him? He's been up there too long. He didn't take anything with him. No one could survive this long on their own up on this mountain. Moses or Aaron, you've got you've got to make us something to replace Moses. We need we need a God in our presence. And Aaron, who didn't really want to do anything, you know, was was kind of forced into a corner when he said, "Okay, I'll tell you what, if you're willing to steal the earrings out of your women and out of your children, I'll do something. You know, and he was hoping that the women would be smart enough not to give them their earrings. But instead, instead, 
they handed these earrings over. And Aaron was forced to do something. He had backed himself into a corner. Now, think about this. Aaron, by, by saying, if you'll take the earrings out, which was a sign for them, okay? It was something for them. Because not only, as, as, as Scripture has many, many levels, we see taking something out of your ears means you don't hear something anymore, right? So he says, you're going to take these earrings out of your ears so that you don't, and it represents taking what they've heard out. That's what it represents, is taking something you have heard out of your ears. Now you literally can't do that, of course, but that's what the representation is. That's what the implication is. So doing this, Aaron now makes this calf, and he he finishes it by hand. He, he builds an altar for it. Uh, and by the way, if you check uh, on the internet, there are pictures of this. They have found, I say they have found, everybody now knows that the real Mount Sinai is in southwestern Saudi Arabia, right? There's pictures of this thing where that calf would have sat. It's still there. Because there's chiseled into these rocks pictures of cows and bulls, okay? So it's there. We know this happened. But Aaron decides to make this thing. Moses confronts him and he says, look, I, I threw this stuff in a fire and this just jumped out. Aaron's lying through his teeth. He, he fashioned it. He made it. And then all of a sudden they turn around and said, oh, this is our God. We're going to have a feast to the God that brought us out of Egypt. There again, we're going to celebrate this God with this God. My dear loving spouse, I'm going to celebrate what you've done for me by putting this person from my past in your face. My dear loving spouse... I am going to steal your respect. I'm going to steal the love that you had. I'm going to steal everything that you tried to give me and force this from my past into your face. Why can't you be like this? You're perfect the way you are. Why can't you change? Do you see where that goes? Do you see why this was so important? Everything that he had told them at the very beginning of of when he comes down on that mountain in the smoke and in the fire, and he says, you will not have any other gods in my face. And what do they do? You know, what do they do? They build a god and shove it in his face. They put it on his dining room table where he has to look at it. That's what they did. That's why this is so important. That's why this golden calf incident is such a pivotal point in the history, not just of the Hebrew nation, but in the history of God interacting with humanity. Because that representation, that representation is every one of us taking our past and saying, why can't you be like this? The Egyptian sun god Ra is the Hebrew word for evil. The sun god, being the god above all the other gods in Egypt, okay, the cow, the Hathor uh, representation, would have carried that family name. So think of it this way. You now not only are bringing this other person into the house and sitting on the table, but it is the epitome of evil that you're bringing to me. It is something so bad, and you're bringing it into my house. You have made it, and you brought it into my house. You have set it on my table where I have to sit and eat. That's what they've done. That's what the implication is. That's what it means. And it gets worse from there. <laughs> you know, not only are you committing adultery, okay, not only... Are you stealing from me? Not only are you lying to me, not only have you done things I really wish you hadn't have done, but you have violated that marriage covenant. In one act, 
you have violated every piece of the covenant I have made with you. That's what this golden calf incident does. That's why it's so important. That's what the foundational aspect of it is. Because we have now, at this point in history, as humanity said, it doesn't matter what you try to do for us, God. We are going to rebel against you every time. Every time. You, you take us out of a bad situation. You try to improve our lives. And because you weren't here, uh, how do I want to say this? Because you weren't here with us physically, in person, making sure that every one of our little itty-bitty needs were being taken care of. We forgot about you. We turned our backs on you. We rebelled against you. We've done all of these things. But guess what? It, It goes farther than that. Because, God, you gave us the free will of knowing and remembering our past, we liked it better than we like you. We, we enjoyed Egypt. How many times did they want to turn around and go back? Often, 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 they, they say, oh, it was better back there. It was better back there. Can't we just go back? No, you can't go back. Because he has something better planned. When the Almighty has something better planned for you, you can never return to where you were it doesn't matter how much you want to it doesn't matter uh you know if if you really liked your and i'm going to use this analogy if you liked your addiction you can never go back and fully like it again because you're going to be aware that there was something better and something different planned for you that's why uh, a lot of people, when they when they get out of rehab, and they look back and they say, "Man, you know, I really like that." You you see, and it doesn't even have to be rehab. You take people who were overweight and they go on a diet, and they lose a lot of weight, and you know, within a few months, they look back at it and say, "Boy, you know, that that cake, that chocolate cake, really, really, oh, I want that piece of chocolate cake." And before you know it, they've eaten the whole cake. So you see, it doesn't matter whether it is addiction. It doesn't matter whether it's gluttony. It doesn't matter what it is. You always, If you go back, you're always going to feel guilty because now you know what it was. And you have to work twice as hard to go back to where you were. Because that same scenario keeps playing in our minds, doesn't it? The Almighty saying, look out, Moses, I'm going to wipe them all out, and I'm going to start over with you. Moses saying, no, 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 wait, stop. You can't do this. So God said, I'm going to find another way. If you came home and your spouse, your loving spouse, who you care for and want to take care of, has a nude statue of someone from their past sitting on your dining room table, okay, your first instinct is not going to be to say to them, oh, my loving dear spouse, what have you done? Your first instinct is going to be to want to do harm, not only to the statue, but to the spouse, right? That's reality. God is real because we see his reality, not only the the lesson of it here in Exodus 32, but we see it in us. You talk about being made in the image of God, that action follows exactly that image, doesn't it? It's not that we look like Him, it's that we act like Him. Even in our anger sometimes, even in our disappointment, you know, when we are that broken hearted over something, and, and trust me, He was broken hearted over this. He didn't want that. His intention was to have this group of people be so willingly obedient that they didn't want anything else but that didn't happen because they rebelled they he wasn't right there telling each one individually what to do when to do it how to do it he wanted to leave it up to them to do it the best way they could and he's still doing that today He's still doing that today. Every time we get in a little bit of a jam, what's our first instinct? 
is not to say, oh, how do I how do I make this outcome to glorify the Almighty? Our first instinct today is, how do I make me look good in this? How do I benefit from this? You see, that is not just human frailty. Not just human frailty. There's so much more that goes into that too. Because in, in, in our Creator's brokenheartedness, when He looks down and He sees what they had done with this golden calf... We do it ourselves. We do it ourselves to a much more human extent because the Almighty, you know, he understood where Moses was coming from when Moses said, no, 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 uh, you, you can't do that. And he said, I'm going to find another way. Very, very few of us would be willing to find another way. We're going to go through with what we think is a good idea at the time. Far too often. And we wind up paying a much greater penalty for it later. A much, much greater penalty for it later. What's wrong with a yellow cow? I can tell you what's wrong with a yellow cow. It represents the violation of every... Let me say that again. It represents a violation of every one of the things that our Creator detests. Not just one or two. It's not just an idol. It's not just another God thrown in his face. But it is everything that he said we should or shouldn't do. It is us doing exactly the opposite. That's what's wrong with the yellow cow. That's what's the, the problem uh, in, in many relationships today. Because we want to continue to bring our past and put it in the face of the one who's giving us a future. We want to bring our past and say, look what I, I used to do, even though our future hasn't got room for that. Just doesn't have room for it at all. As some things from our past, yes, they're, they're lovely, they're nice, they're wonderful, but it's the junk that I'm talking about, okay? When, when the Hebrew people and that mixed multitude with them came out of Egypt they understood their past the almighty was going to give them the opportunity to use that understanding of their past to build a better future but instead they wanted to go back so bad that they brought the worst that they could find and they put it in the face of the almighty and said look what we've done for you is it any wonder he got so mad. Is it any wonder he was so upset? Is it any wonder he was ready to wipe them out? He was, he was probably ready to destroy everything at that point in time. But he didn't do it. He found another way. He provided a different way. He said, I'll do something different. Now, as a constant reminder that we had violated every single ordinance he laid out. He then puts in place a sacrificial system. And that sacrificial system is nothing more than a constant reminder that because we now owe the death penalty, because remember this was a blood covenant that we violated, we now deserve death. There is absolutely no way that the blood of a goat or a lamb or a bull or a heifer or even a, a dove is ever going to satisfy what we owe. Just like if our spouse came home and we were the ones who had put this statue on the table. We would get exactly what we deserved if they picked that statue up and and did their worst to us. We would deserve it because we were guilty. We would deserve it because we had violated their trust. We had violated their respect. We had violated everything that we had promised them. We blew it. We messed up. We would deserve it. But a patient spouse and a patient God says, I will find another way. 
You ha I know that you have, this is what you used to do. Let me show you a better way. Let's, let's look around and see what we can do. Is there going to be punishment? Oh, there, there's going to be payment that needs to be made. Oh, yes. What, you're, what the spouse is going to do kind of depends on how serious the situation is at the time, doesn't it? But God said, I'm going to find a different way. And, and his different way was to be a constant reminder to these people that they messed up. And that they needed to see death all the time. They needed to understand how serious this was. In today's society, at least in the United States, you know, if you did this to your spouse, uh, annulment or divorce would probably be the result of that. Uh, termination of the marriage would be, and you'd each go your separate way. But when you're dealing with the Almighty, the only termination is the death of the offending party. We needed to see death all the time. It needed to be present. It needed to be in the forefront of our minds. Until such a time as Daniel chapter 9 describes the satisfaction of making sure that the sacrifices and the oblations would stop. There is an incident in Daniel chapter 9 and, and it says, it describes this incident and it says it will be one singular event that will cause the sacrifices and the oblations to cease. And depending on your worldview, um, that kind of depends on whether you believe that is the crucifixion of Yeshua or whether you believe it is the destruction of the temple. So depending on your worldview and your outcome there, that's one or the other of them. That's one, or the, that's one of your options that you have, or the only two options, I should say, that you have from Daniel chapter 9, where you have that single event that causes the sacrifices and the oblations to cease. <clears throat> they, were no longer, they would no longer be necessary. Um, without going into a whole lot of detail about that, all right, that's kind of where I'm going to leave that for right now. Because what I really wanted to concentrate on is making certain that you know what's wrong with the yellow cow. You absolutely know that that golden calf represented everything, everything that was evil that they had brought with them out of Egypt. It, it's not even the turning around and going back, but it's the bringing it with you. It's, and it's so much more than that. It's not just bringing it with you, but it's putting all of that evil in the face of the one who's trying his best to improve your life. That will never have a positive outcome. The bad stuff that was in your past needs to stay there. You need to use it to improve yourself, not drag it along with you. And you certainly don't want to be shoving it in the face of the one who's trying to help you. It just doesn't work like that. It will never work like that. You will never have a positive uh, relationship with anyone if you are constantly trying to drive something into their face and into their heart and into their mind and into their soul that doesn't need to be there. And it doesn't matter whether it is a a person that you're involved with in a relationship it doesn't matter if it's in a relationship with the almighty what matters is that you leave that bad stuff in the past and you build on the good stuff to build a better future and improve who you are because only then only when you're trying to improve who you are are you going to be willing to leave that junk behind okay I hope that really explains the golden calf incident, as I like to refer to it. Have a wonderful, blessed week. <laughs>